I'm glad you brought up COVID because a lot of, uh, you know, UPSers in the warehouse and in, in the package car died and they, they got mm. sick in addition to heat stroke um, and, you know, a 24 year old in California dying on his birthday. So this is a company that very evidently by how it treats its workers uh, really just cares about how much money they're, they're getting. And we are starting to see a shift. When you talk about the stock buybacks, actually UPS certainly has done that in the past, but we're seeing a, a ramping up of that practice recently. There seems to be an interesting shift going on. Carol Tomei, who comes from Home Depot, that's the CEO. Mm. Now um, there seems to be a shift towards sort of more classically leaner and meaner companies that we saw over the decades, you know, corporate restructuring, uh, you know, uh, FedEx, for example, has all independent contractors, this sort of business model that shifts all of the uh, shifts, all of the, uh, you know, uh, liabilities onto the worker um, sh and just, you know, makes everything flexible for the company, but worse and, and less stable for the worker. Uh, and that, you know, is accompanied by things like stock buybacks, uh, and the uh, executive suite getting more compensation than we have ever seen. But I think a really important thing to mention, just the, the reason also why that UPS is a wildly profitable company, not just in the past few years, it exploded in the past few years, no doubt. But it's because 60% of the workforce are part-timers like Luigi. And I don't know if Luigi, I, I forget if you mentioned specifically, you talked about how hard your work is, but these guys are paid fifteen fifty an hour. Um, and, you know, throughout the pandemic, sometimes they were being uh, worked full-time hours. Now their their hours are being cut, um, presumably because there's lower volume, but largely perhaps, uh, according to workers, they think this has something to do with trying to starve these workers out who, are, you know, need to do multiple jobs. And this has been a trend for, for decades. This is why they went on strike in 1997. 185,000 Teamsters went on strike in 1997 to fight for part-time America won't work. And now this is... Similarly, it's not being uh, talked about quite as loudly, but that is the reason why UPS is what it is today. That is what expanded its growth. So I, I, I want to move and get into some of the historical context here, but real quick, we're on this point. Um, I was reading that there is this push, not just with UPS, but in some other industries as well, I think also with Amazon, to have a kind of Uber, Lyft style arrangement where individuals uh, can contract to deliver packages can you maybe Luigi, you're aware of, or I don't know which of you wants to speak to this, but how prevalent is that, and what, and 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 how central is that to what's going on with these contract negotiations? Uh, in that aspect, the same. Greg is a driver, so I'm sure that he's dealing with that every day. You want to answer that? Sure. Um, they are what we refer to as PVDs, uh, personal vehicle drivers. Um, it depends on the area of the country. There are some places where they use them all year. Um, in most of the country, they use them uh, more or less for uh, peak season and Christmas. Um, and what they do is they basically uh, come up to the building after all the regular drivers are gone and they load their cars um, full of packages and they go out and deliver them. And they are they are very much uh, like Uber drivers. Um, you know, they're paid uh, a certain amount of mileage or whatever, but it's all very minimal. Um, they're driving their own vehicles, their own insurance, uh, their own gas. Um, it's not uh, a very lucrative operation, as most of them discover very quickly. Uh, UPS's demands for performance uh, extend to them, <laughs> even mm. though they're getting them for so much cheaper. Um, and you rarely see people do it for more than uh, uh, one season, if they last the season at all. Um, and and just to go back to Teddy's point, I think sort of the the big uh, the big picture that we're we're missing that he's sort of alluding to here is what we're we're looking at is sort of the the Amazon effect on corporate America. Um, there's sort of uh, you know the, the the Silicon Valley model of the stock buybacks and the lean mean company and everything else that Amazon certainly has exploited uh, beyond all measure um, and. These older companies like UPS are seeing that and seeing those crazy profits and seeing that and trying to sort of take their old models and emulate 
uh, that model of business. And so what Carol Tomei has done is sort of trim everything possible uh, from the corporation. They've removed just about all the HR department. They've removed a ton of the sales department. They've removed uh, just section after section in within the corporation itself. Um, lots of middle management has been removed in the last, certainly in my career. Um, and so uh, the goal is just minimizing, minimizing, minimizing every expense to maximize that profit, maximize that uh, that dividend, maximize that stock buyback so that uh, the stock price stays up because that's how every person in management at UPS is compensated, is in shares of the company. And so it's almost this idea of uh, uh, eating itself, a willingness to, to literally pick the company apart and almost destroy it just to squeeze every last drop of profit out of it. And, uh, you know, to, to answer why UPS can manage to be so ridiculously profitable, uh, again, to put it in a larger context, is because there really is no competition. Um, like a lot of things uh, here in America, we have this illusion of competition, right? We have an illusion. You go down the, the supermarket aisle and you see 85,000 kinds of cereal, but there's really only three cereal companies, Yeah, right? You see, uh, you know, 80,000 kinds of soda, but there's really only two soda companies. And package delivery is no different. You're dealing with the Postal Service, you're dealing with UPS, and you're dealing with FedEx. Uh, DHL is very, very minor. There's some minor companies beyond that. But between the three of them, that's the industry. And so there's nowhere to go. If you're unhappy with UPS's prices, you can go to FedEx, but you're going to get, you know, not the same service level. Uh, or you can go to the Postal Service, you know, and, and deal with the same issues. And so it, it's there's really no actual competition. You and know, of course, UPS there's been raises... this war on the Postal Service's uh, funding, probably that's right. not unrelated to what you're going through. Uh, right. And uh, yeah, just, yeah. Just I just wanted to I just wanted to add on to what Greg was saying, just about um, you know, the PBDs, the leaner, the meaner. Like the new uh, motto, I believe, of UPS is, is better, not bigger, which is very ironic in a, in a way because. They did actually much better than one of their biggest competitors, FedEx, which, as I said, has an independent contractor model. So they basically all those people, those FedEx trucks you see everywhere, they're not employees mm -hmm. of FedEx. Mm -hmm. um, and FedEx did pretty poorly during the pandemic. I mean, they don't, they, I'm sure they did fine, <laughs> but they didn't do as well as UPS. Uh, and that's because UPS has 350,000 union workers. They have structure. And they, of course, are exploiting them. They probably should have more workers if you want to deliver that many packages. Um, and just to put a T on sort of the PVD thing, uh, I've been talking to a lot of PVDs recently. Um, and I just want to explain to people, right, this is a deterioration of the package car drop. That's what it is. They're trying to shrink the bargaining unit. They're trying to shift union jobs into these precarious gig mm -hmm. work uh, that that we are seeing spread around the country. Um, and it's dangerous. First of all, this is delivery, right? Um, people aren't expecting a person in a Honda pulling up and like just walking up to their driveway. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've heard horror stories of people being shot at, yeah. people being threatened, dogs biting people, crashes. Um, you know, some, some of these people do get uh, car uh, accident insurance, but some don't. Depends on where you are. It's part of the problem. What the heck is going on? You don't know. In a union contract, you have it. You can see it. And that's what they're trying to take away. Yeah. And can I add something Please. related to that? Uh, because I was telling you that for us, uh, we are guaranteed three hours and a half. But that only happens once you make book and you are under the union contract. It took me five months to be under, under those conditions. And when you are a temporary worker, uh, you don't have zero hours guarantee. So it will happen to me that I will show up at 4 a.m. or 3.30 in peak season ready to work and they will send me home. Mm. I will not work one single minute. Mm. So I woke up 2 a.m. I spend money on transportation. Went there and they say, no, we are good. We don't need you today. And you are uh, sent home. And it's uh, that means that someone couldn't share time with their family, with their friends, etc. And it's, you know, I left crying a couple of times because it's very, you know, discouraging. Yeah. And what happens that you see that someone is sent home, at the same time, 
you are being kicked by all the packages. So it's like, why am I doing all these giant efforts doing 1,000 packages? When someone came back, uh, came to work, I was sent home. And I don't know how it's at the national level, but at my workhouse, my sector is, I would say, 95% black, brown, immigrants like me, workers in full stamp, uh, having two jobs, sometimes uh, free jobs. Um, the people who started with me at the same time, many of the friends that I made, they're not working there anymore. And I am trying to tell them, don't leave. <laughs> a contract is coming. We might go on a strike. Things can change. But we live uh, weekly. So some people can't even wait for a new contract. Yeah. So that's you know, another way of uh, maximizing profits uh, all the time. Yeah, I mean, this story is incredibly compelling. And and Teddy, when you say 350,000 workers, I mean, I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that if UPS were to go on strike, it would be the biggest strike in American history against a single employer. Yep, it would be the largest single employer strike in U.S. history, I think, in t- one of the top five or top three largest strikes in U.S. history, period. So this is just an enormous bargaining unit of semi-truck drivers, technicians, uh, package car drivers like Greg, the people we know and love and to see every day, um, and then mostly people like Luigi. Um, and, and this who, isn't a a rail strike scenario where there, you have a Railway Labor Act situation that allows the president to quash the strike, right? Although, and maybe we should go back now to the example that you raised from 1997, my understanding is that there was pressure back then for Bill Clinton to intercede to negotiate and resolve uh, the the negotiations before uh, the strike threat could really be exercised, and he declined to do yeah. so. Can you speak a little to the posture of that moment as compared to what you expect to happen now? Sure. Um, well, UPS pilots are under the Railway Labor Act, which is highly restrictive on their mm. you know their labor rights. Um, UPSers are under Taft-Hartley, you know, basically the amendment of the NLRA. Um, and so, yeah, it, it would be far more of a message for a president to, you know, uh, file an injunction to force workers back to work. Um, and you'd have to piss off a lot of people because as in 1997, there was a lot of pressure on Bill Clinton not to do it mm. because the public supported the workers two to one. Um, UPSers people see every day. It's popular. Unfortunately, rail workers uh, didn't quite have as much popularity. People didn't really know what was going on. Maybe that's a failure of the part of the media. Also, with 350,000, I'm really bad at carrying zeros, but that feels like one out of every thousand Americans. Is that right? I think I calculated this at one point, and it's something like that. It's like one out of uh, something like that. It's pretty wild. Um, yeah. But also, if you count the family members, this is a contract that affects one million people. So these people can sign a contract and change the life of one million people. I feel like there is no contract negotiation with this kind of effect in real life. Yeah. I think I think the question, just to your original question, uh, are we in a different political circumstance? Well, 97, as I said, was about many of the same issues as it is today. Um, part-time America won't work. That was the motto. It was because, and it was so popular because UPS was a leader in the corporate restructuring, uh, you know, parts of part, you know, we, we hear about uh, outsourcing, we hear about moving factories to the Sun Belt. Uh, one big part of this moment in the 80s and the 90s was corporate restructuring. And part of that was trimming down on full time work and uh, increasing part time work. And that's exactly what happened at UPS. They were a leader in this. This was happening across America and people were pissed off. And the Teamsters, great communication strategy, great organization. Uh, captured people's hearts and minds. Um, and so that two to one, uh, you know, public support for the UPSers versus the company, that just didn't, that didn't just appear as part, it was part of social conditions, but also the Teamsters fighting hard. 26 years later, are we in that position? It's a good question. I mean, people support unions far more than they did in 1997, you know, we're at a historic high. Uh, people probably interact with UPSers far more than they did in 1997. Um, and I don't know, part-time gig, temporary work, like contingent labor. I think we all are still dealing with a lot of those. So as long as we have a good messaging, as long as the UPSers are, are, are you know, uh, organized, I would, I, I and a lot of people are going to be mad at Biden if he tries to stop this strike that is 
you know, heralding a hopefully resurg a resurgent labor movement. So how do we get here? Because my understanding is that the the existing contract, the last contract, um, was perhaps a victim of what we were just we were talking about Luigi at the worker strike back event, the the problem of uh, business unionism. And I've been reading about some criticism of Jimmy Hoffa Jr. and him playing the role that was more akin to feeling like his job was to grease the wheels with management as, as opposed to genuinely negotiating on behalf of the workforce. I see some nodding heads. Greg, can you speak to that? Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess we have to go back to uh, after the 97 strike, uh, which was led by Ron Carey, who was a much more activist uh, reform uh, worker led leader. Um, Hoffa came to power uh, and, as you just said, took the approach of, uh, you know, what's good for the company is good for the worker, um, which is not really uh, a union approach, but he was, in fact, a lawyer and not really a union member. So uh, that's another <laughs> story. Mm. Um, and so what we have had uh, is basically 20 years of that approach of, well, this is what the company wants. Uh, we're going to give it to them because if they make more money, we'll be better off. Um, which culminated in the last contract in 2018, uh, which I, I can only say was so egregious uh, that we actually voted it down, um, which, you know, with the number of members that we have and the limited time we have to organize something like a vote, vote no campaign uh, was a pretty major accomplishment. Um, unfortunately, there was this uh, sort of antiquated loophole in the Teamster Constitution um, that allowed for the general president to impose the contract uh, if uh, if less than 50 percent of the members voted, two thirds of those members would have to vote it down for it to be voted down. So even though we we had a majority of members voted down, uh, the contract was imposed upon us, um, which led to uh, Hoffa's retirement, knowing he was going to lose. Uh, Sean O'Brien and Fred Zuckerman, our new leaders, handily beating uh, his anointed successors. Uh, and sort of put us in the position that we're in uh, to take on UPS. So uh, that's that's how we got here. Uh, that's where a lot of this anger and frustration is coming from, is that uh, the last one was just sort of the final straw as far as, as you said, business unionism and the Teamsters Union goes. Uh, and so uh, we're taking a new approach. We've got new leadership, and uh, that's where our contract fight is coming from. So... One of the cri criticisms that was made in the context of the railway labor strike that wasn't was that some argued that the union itself wasn't prepared to go on strike in actuality, um, that the there was some ambivalence about whether or not it was worth uh, depleting union funds to implement a strike. There was some risk aversion. There was um, a lack of logistical follow through. You know, uh, there were some there were some internal factors outside of whatever Biden was going to do with the Railway Labor Act that made it so that it was basically an empty threat. Um, and the power of the union being the actual threat to strike has to be actualized. It has to be a real threat to to have that fire behind it. And some people argue that, well, you shouldn't even be that mad a Biden or whomever, because it wasn't going to happen, or the squad for by, uh, voting for the agreement or whatever it was, because they weren't going to do it anyway. And so I wonder if you have any insight into the willingness, the ability to actually go on strike, what the conversations are like among workers right now, and how confident you are in the new union leadership about having a genuine willingness to pull the trigger. Well, I think there's no question they have the willingness to pull the trigger. I've known uh, Sean uh, personally. He was my business agent when I first started at UPS. So I've known him personally for 19 years. Uh, he is nothing else if not a fighter. Um, he has been dealing with UPS longer than I have, uh, even though he never worked at UPS. Um, and his uh, disdain for this company is probably second to none. Um, as far as the readiness and the willingness, um, there's always trepidation. There's always sort of doubt about any situation like this um, as far as what could happen, what might happen, um, what happened with the railroad workers, you know, certainly adds to that. Um, and it's certainly been an education uh, for our members to let them know that we're not under the Railway Labor Act, that Congress doesn't have that authority with us. Um, it's a very, very different situation where you have multiple unions, some big, some small. 
um, some sort of almost subverting each other by agreeing to something when the others hadn't and in uh, in a wider dispersal of sort of fewer employees, so less connections between them. Mm. Um, So there's always that sort of fear. um, But I have been confident uh, and I think I saw that today as we did some practice picketing in my building, that when push comes to shove, uh, when the chips are down, uh, the Teamsters are ready to step up and and, and stand for what they, they deserve. Uh, and so I think if it comes to that on August 1st, uh, there's little doubt in my mind that we will be ready. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.